We aren't helping Amazon's users understand that. Hmm? <coughs> you don't think, think Amazon's got a priority? Right? No. I mean, well, it, but I think, well, well, let me, let me, I'm going to go back to that one second. Yeah. One second. What, I, what I think, you know, this being Berkman and Berkman being the incredible leader in thinking about the internet in this country, and now with this wonderful tie to architecture in both senses of the word, I would love to see some senses of the principles that come out of this discussion today, mm -hmm. right? What, 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 are the, what are the emerging principles that we're trying to talk about here? And I hear context, though as I say context is I think is very difficult mm -hmm. to, to deal with. Um, it's a very complex, I hear usage from Dana. I hear control, though that's difficult too. Um, I hear transparency in our discussion before uh, that you mentioned as a, as, as a context. So, you know, what are the appropriate behaviors that enable a public and public discussion to be created that at the same time preserve the rights and privacies that we have and, and, and where that goes? So why, what does Amazon do wrong or what could they do better? Uh, what's the lesson? Well, I mean, it's le that, that particular question is less interesting to me than, than transparency and usage. I mean, I, I, still, I still want to hear what Amazon does wrong. Just for oh, a quick, really? Quick sec yeah, quick um, second. Harry Potter issue, right? Uh, the, the massively popular things badly skew their recommendation algorithm. So, oh, okay. Okay, you know, I'll get continually, I can't stand fantasy. And yet, so it's not a matter of principle, it's a matter of execution. Yeah, well, <laughs> it's a little bit of both. Okay, all right, yeah. all right. Okay, keep going then, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, I mean, to me, you know, one of the things that I tried to inscribe in my distinction between the things which were like kind of less problematic and less threatening and, and more problematic and, and more injurious was the, the local use of locally gathered information. Um, and to my mind, if you're just acting on something in its immediate physical ambit, that is, and, and you know, space and time, um, that is ultimately going to be less of an issue for me personally than something. I, I mean, I just don't believe in anonymous data anymore. I don't think that we can speak of anonymous data unless something is in perfect and serene isolation. You don't think we can create policies to maintain the, the anonymity? I mean, you're right in the sense that you pull multiple data sets together, you can read by anything, yeah. right? But couldn't we create an, an accountability framework in which that data was was walled off effectively for use? Uh, in law, but not necessarily in practice. And but isn't there? But there, but it, but it's worth trying, yeah. you know, because well. because um, one of Google's founders has said that if we use the flu trends to predict the next pandemic, we could save, in his perhaps overblown calculation, a third of the population of Earth. Um, so there, there's some. It's context. worth trying. There's some context in which predictive analytics of that of that form, you know, don't really bother me at all. But in, there are other contexts in which predictive analytics so clearly cut against our, our social contract. I mean, think about, you know, the police would love to be able to use predictive analytics to, to cite resources and to say, well, we know where the last 15 murders in the city have occurred. And, you know, we're going to, like, locate our resources in neighborhoods where we know that crime is about to happen, right? It's, it stands to reason. And yet it cuts against our entire history of law and jurisprudence. And, and it, it, it's redlining, right? I mean, it's going to lead to that sort of thing inevitably and, and wherever enacted. And I think, you know, Ooh, if we, if we can see that, that's, you don't that's think that's all? I don't think it's going too far. I think that's, I think that's good budgeting. I, I, I would sensible. I, um, I, I know a lot if of you're, people. If, you're, if, you're argue, well, if the argument is that police could prevent someone from being murdered, how is it a bad thing to have them try to do that in that, in that context? Right? If it leads to kinds of profiling that are injurious to people's life. That's a different question. That's a different question. I don't think it is. I think, I think the two things have become very similar. That, that's where you go back to this idea of you're not allowed to know that. You're not, not allowed to act on that. So that if you say we have to have, by a matter of principle, the same number of police per square mile no, throughout the whole no, place. No, that's, that would be an absurdity. That's okay, well, that's where you're headed. Not necessarily. I, I don't know. I mean, I, I think this could require an afternoon. All right, fine. We'll 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 yeah. Jeff. You displayed that magnificent image of someone's data shadow, as you put it, being displayed, which, which I kind of love, as long as everybody knows what's going on, and you talk about controls over that. But back to creepiness, I hear people talk about using AR with, you know, the fact that we can use facial recognition, the fact that we, with AR, we could have Google goggles tell us, you know, I could scan the room and find out, you know, Weinberger's a vegetarian, and that, you know, that Ethan does this, and so on and so forth. That I hear often is described as creepy. So, what are the principles? I, I think the value of what you propose is great. What are the principles that you would try to have to make it operate in such a way that people would welcome it rather than call you creepy? Well, I have a 16 year son, old son who's currently doing his final exams in high school. And it's, it's in the inner city school in Switzerland, so there's, even in Switzerland, there's a lot of cheating going on. And we've been talking a little bit earlier about how we could design the space to 
redesign the space to encourage probably better interaction and, and maybe even a fairer uh, uh, way of acting, right? And I think that the anxiety of those kids are mainly that it's such a lack of uh, tracking of what people are doing, right? Because the, the, the fair people who not cheat are getting punished in a world where um, the information is incomplete, right? So there's a benefit to them I think there's a benefit to have their them. identities tied to the information that is legitimate about them. Well, I, th I think the whole thing about the hyperpublic and this campus that we're creating is a bit based on the premise that if you are, essentially, if you're an honest citizen, if you're a good person, you have, you benefit from things being public yeah. and yeah. open. I, I agree. And I, when, I, when I drove into Amsterdam last time, I was driven into Amsterdam, and we hit some point in the in the in the road. Everyone slowed down to the speed limit. Everyone. And I was, as an American, I was freaked. Right? What's going on here? And the driver said, oh, we're, you know, it's a sensor and we'll all get tickets. So on the one hand, logically, that makes perfect sense. To an American, it seems creepy. It seems like a bad local use of this data, right? Logically, it says we're going we're gonna to reduce accidents and save lives and it's a good thing. But it's a case where our norms and our laws just, and our technology just don't match yet, right? If you could all be in Google's auto-driven car, that would be wonderful, but we lose control and we don't like that. And we're, this is exactly what we're trying to negotiate now. Benefit. Yeah. We're, 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 yeah, but this is, we're talking too much about fear, I think, and not enough about benefit. I think this is a slightly different issue. I think it is, ties in into what Betsy was saying about shame and shamefulness. I think that, I think the more you're shameful about something, the more you fear this lack of privacy. Yes, but that'll strike some as puritanical. <coughs> not that you're from, not from the, the oh, birthplace of that, yes. Um, <laughs> there's a little Calvinistic in, in, and I don't disagree with you, but I think that's, that's the fear is that somehow it becomes kind of a, a judgment matter. Uh, that goes to Eric Schmidt's line that if you're, uh, if you're gonna be ashamed of people knowing that you do this, then you shouldn't perhaps be doing it. Which I think makes perfect sense, but got as often Eric Schmidt lines are tweeted and misconstrued. Do you, what do you think of that, that construction right there? I would think that you'd I, It has never historically sat well with me. I, I didn't figure it would, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Let me come on out and, uh, and get the discussion going larger. Anybody? It sounds like more, it's, it's a question of abuse. Like a hyperpublic design would be very good, but then Looks like maybe we need to have systems in place that part of the design should be to prevent abuse. Because the one person's concern of, about abusing the system, of, say for example, predictive analytics, for example, if you take the predictive analytics, essentially you're still guessing and you could get it wrong and humans tend to be lazy and we rely on it too much. And so maybe, it's like, how do you prevent people from overly relying on something that's just a guesswork? You were talking earlier about the social network you're trying to create. And that part of the issue, and I was talking with someone else here about a social network, that part of the issue here is the expectation of it. That if Facebook were presented as a sharing service, the whole reason to be here is just to share, Twitter-like, then the fears about privacy would be lessened, right? So the, the definition of abuse goes into the, the prediction, the, 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 what you think this thing does, right? Yeah, exactly. So, and that's where the Harry Potter thing comes, comes to, because the, the prediction algorithm is not doing it, its job right. That's why you said it's about the execution. So maybe we are relying on it too much, as opposed to being aware of it, but maybe it should be part of the design itself to not rely on it so much. I should point out too that like Amazon, I mean I've bought one book, one book a week from Amazon since 1997. Amazon has more information about me, my habits, my behaviors and predilections as expressed through the exchange of hard currency than any other organization on earth, including Google, and they're still recommending Harry Potter to me. So, you can you fix know. that, but it provides the means. You can say, don't use this again. It gave you the power, you just want to complain about it. No, I do use that, I check that box, it comes back up. There's something in- You can't kill Harry Potter. Well, this is what we're being I'm told. I'm sympathetic yeah, to your, your prevail. Maybe you just read it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like that's not normative, come on. Over here. Hi, I'm Jean Rosenberg from Brew College and CUNY. Um, in, uh, I guess this week, a couple of conversations came up around privacy 
yesterday at Berkman and before that at a corporate council um, conference that I attended. And um, I'm interested in getting the panel's read on it. When you think about privacy and what you've been discussing, you've been discussing the privacy interests of the individual and what's at risk when that individual loses you know, some of his or her privacy. But what about risks relating to third-party abuse, such as the example of insider trading? If you've got a CEO of one company that's going to some you know, small Midwestern city, and so someone third party can kind of put together that maybe there's some deal that's in the works and then take advantage of that and basically um, take advantage of investors who don't have that information, who haven't researched that. Sure. Or what about an example that some of the youth media team were talking about yesterday of knowing someone's location and then being able to break into that person's house? You know, what about abuse of information in ways that aren't necessarily offensive to the person, to the individual in terms of their privacy, but that can cause risks to their safety or can cause you know, some risk to their property? Or, you know, what about when they are offensive? I mean, you know, we were told when the backscatter and millimeter wave machines were introduced at the airports that, that you know, those scans would be like locked up and never available to any third party. And, you know, very, very early on, it became obvious to everybody who had any knowledge of those machines whatsoever that, that these printouts were being passed around by the TSA people, that they were escaping from the containment that was designed for them. And that, in principle, there's, there's no way to design these sort of perfect isolation bubbles in which these, the, you know, these facts can, can reside. So I, I tend to think the Canadian um, Office of the Privacy Commissioner has a little piece of dog roll that they use. That It's a little cute, but it makes a lot of sense to me. It says, if you can't protect it, don't collect it. And, and that has to be my bottom line on all of this stuff, even if there is value that might be mined from that information in the, in the future. Um, if you have no way of protecting that information, then you have to assume that some harm can come to vest in the lives and the life choices of the people that that information has been gathered from. And that's, you know, uh, that's what doctors have been doing for millennia, right? Like, first, do no harm. And that should be our principle here as well. I don't, I'm just not convinced by the notion that there's all this amazing benefit out there to be derived from this that outweighs the potential damage, to, uh, particularly to vulnerable individuals. But, but go ahead. Well, I'm, I, first, I, I'm all for protection of privacy, it's not that. But in the two examples that have been s talked about, the Harry Potter example, or the intruders who gets the information to get into a house, into your house, the problem there is really that the information is not complete. There's not enough information. Amazon doesn't know enough about you, otherwise it wouldn't. If, if the system would know about the intruders, that wouldn't happen either, right? So it's, it's an uncanny valley problem. We've got almost enough information, but not quite a perfect amount. Yeah, so you can either try to hold it back or push it further. It's like a train that goes perhaps in the wrong direction, but at least accelerate it so that it crashes. But at this point, you're just holding something back. That is, uh, <laughs> I, I want that to be the design principle that's, that's built in everything. You know, push it further so that at least it crashes. I think that's beautiful. <laughs> um, there, there's another angle here that's worth, worth mentioning, right, which is, um, you can maybe get both worlds. So, so the location example of, I don't know if it's Facebook or Foursquare, where it was like the please rob me thing. Um, that's an individual with an identity posting their location, right? Um, the, the flip side of that is anonymous collection of location data like that that is done in sort of the location services industry at large, right? Where it actually does provide tremendous value, and you can capture that value while protecting the identified data set. And I think that's the distinction that, that is most interesting to me, right, is how do, you, how do you get the latter bit of that while protecting the identities involved so that you can prevent that type of, that type of breach? This is turning into to, to the classic discussion we have these days around fear and privacy. Yeah. If that notion of if you can't protect it, don't collect it, means that you'll never collect anything because some, you're always managing to the worst possible case the lowest, the highest common denominator of fear and, but and Jeff, liability. What's, but and what's if something wrong could that? go wrong with it, then you, sh then you shouldn't collect it. I don't want to live in that world. I really don't. By the way, well, I see, but I'm, a, I'm a weird guy. I wanted to use my TSA scan as my author photo. <laughs> Over here. Um, yeah, I wanted to uh, push back on the two of the panelists who, <clears throat> who paint this picture of privacy is really, you know, don't, if you have something to hide, don't share, you know, only the people who have something to hide are the ones who won't share it. I, I'm reminded of many years ago, one of my first 
uh, task was for a, a, a cancer registry, I mean a disease registry, and they wanted to make sure that people who had HIV diagnosis were not released. And so it's a very simple thing. You have HIV, we're not supposed to release that information. But now you have a list of all these patients, and the only ones blotted out are the ones who have HIV. So it became immediately clear to me that privacy can't be the issue of hiding only that which, which you, from an individual perspective. That in the case of that registry, it had to be a kind of societal value. And that I had to also suppress other people who didn't have HIV in order to protect the people who did have <coughs> HIV and adhere to this societal regulation. Well, let me, I'll come back to you first myself. Right, so, but, but then, then you affected those people whom you also blotted out. I wrote about my prostate cancer. I got incredible benefit by doing it under my name. It was my choice, and it was easy for me to do it because I'm a white American male in the US and, and I'm public and obnoxious. But I got incredible value back because my name was attached. I got friends who brought me advice, who brought me benefit that I could not have gotten otherwise. Right, so, so in the effort to come up with the safe rule for all, you affect people in two ways. Uh, actually, that's not correct. So remember, I live in the world of parallel universes. That, the universe that I talked about was the universe where we have a regulation that who couldn't find out about your prostate cancer, you, the, you couldn't find out it from this source. It didn't mean that there didn't exist another universe in which you could find out about it, and the example you gave was one where you gave that information. Any other questions? Any other reaction to this? Or? I think Tanya's point is a, is a very profound one. I wanted to, to go back to a point Betsy made uh, a couple of times, actually, in, in what she was saying, um, which had to do with maybe going back to a point, again, in Tanya's slides this morning. Maybe this isn't actually a trade-off at all. Maybe you can have both. Maybe you can have privacy protection um, and still have a flourishing advertising ecosystem. Um, and one observation I would make is that what makes us individuals are the differences between us. Mm -hmm. uh, e even identical twins are different. But what makes us economically valuable is our similarities. Do you think that that leads us to any kind of potential solution to some of the intractable problems we've been discussing? I'm not sure I completely understood the question, so let's, let's, see, if, let's see if my response makes any sense. Um, what, what you said resonates, right, in the sense that um, the types of value that I think about from big data is, I mean, Jeff, point taken that there's value in you sharing your individual life history, but I'm actually more interested in the aggregate sort of analysis of social data where you do actually find similarities, right? You're applying statistical machine learning to a big data set to learn something interesting about that big data set. You don't need to reveal anything about the individual pieces of data in there, even though, as has been pointed out, any one of those individual pieces of data is probably re-identifiable in some theoretical world, right? Um, and so I think you can put in systems to provide accountability and protection of that aggregate data set to protect against that risk. I, you, spot on. I mean, I, I, think okay. I think your response was, was gratifying. I think it also goes beyond economic value. Um, if you're looking at an individual and those individual characteristics, and they are unique um, from a medical point of view, you're in the territory of Dr. House, um, you know, <laughs> Freakville, um, medical detective work. For most people, it's the similarities that let doctors diagnose the problems we have. So I think what you say is potentially also applicable in medical record protection. If we have time for a few more. Yeah. Um, I wanted to go back to some of the examples you gave, Adam, uh, and you talked about how the, uh, this morning there was a lot of talk about how informed consent might not be the paradigm in which we are moving towards. It seems to me that there's a possibility that we're moving towards what might be called uninformed consent, and I was wondering if that you find um, you know, in a, if that's the case, where we interact, where we have the option to choose to engage with systems but are not really told the results of what that system is doing or collecting, uh, 
if you see that as a trend, and if it's so, whether it's problematic. Yeah, um, so the, the construction I apply to these things is very much about um, another distinction which the morning also revealed to be increasingly problematic, which is that between public and private space, right? I mean, if we're blurring the thresholds and boundaries between these conditions, then some of the things that I'm talking about and asking for don't really hold up very well, and we should be really clear about that. The existence of a screen that's capable of capturing biometric identifying information about you doesn't bother me if it's in the Prada store. It doesn't bother me if it's in Walmart. It doesn't bother me if it's in McDonald's because in some senses you've consented to that by crossing the threshold, right? And, and I think that there's probably, that could be argued as well, but as, as sort of a clear identifying marker for me where, where, you know, that's not my domain, that's not what I'm designing for. I'm designing for what we traditionally call public space and, and the condition of the street. And in that context, there's no way to inform you or achieve your consent. Your consent is implicit. Your consent is bound up in the action of passing in front of a screen like that. And again, you know, I might not be the most effective advocate for the things that I believe, um, but <clears throat> that doesn't sit right with me just as somebody who walks through the streets of the city. Do I have anything that I necessarily need to feel guilty about? Um, I don't know. I don't know that that's the question, though. Are there policies and procedures would, which could be enacted on the basis of that information which would be detrimental to me or run strongly at variance with my desires? Absolutely, and that has nothing to do with shame or guilt or any of those interiorities. So again, there's this sort of user experience challenge. I mean, if, if you're gonna design something that lives in public space um, and is gonna be gathering that information and there is this burden upon you to inform people of that, and to, to you know, get some kind of acquiescence from them, some kind of formal acquiescence from them before proceeding with that. How do you design that into a situation where somebody's walking past that at normal speed and the engagement itself might last a third of a second? If you can't respond to that in a meaningful way, then I think you ought not to be deploying that technology there. Um, what I'm interested in doing right now, personally, as a designer, is finding out a lot more about the future history of informed consent. Because frankly, it's the model that I've built a lot of my assumptions on and if that's kind of being subjected to evolutionary pressure at this moment in history, um, oh boy, I better need to find out about what comes next because it, it is implicit in what I designed that there is this model of, of agency and consent. Thanks, uh, Jenny Toomey. Um, how many of you guys have ever heard of the band or the individual musician, Momus? Because he has a great song called The Age of Information, which definitely runs into the sort of utopic language around this, where basically the substance of the song is, in the future everyone will know everything about you and they will decide whether they're your friend based on who you actually are, which I think was uh, really contemporaneous to what the 15 years ago when he wrote it, it was a very utopic, exciting uh, idea of a song. But I wanted to push back on two memes that I keep hearing in this space and that came out on this panel as well that I'm not sure if I believe. And the first one, um, Latanya addressed very clearly, which is you know this idea that uh, if you don't have anything to hide, uh, you're going to benefit. And I really don't agree with that. And I actually heard Evan Moglen on Science Friday a couple weeks ago just saying it very clearly. You know, while uh, while it may be true that you're not doing anything that is wrong, uh, there have things been things historically that are always private, where your children are. You know, what medications you take. You know, what your symptoms are uh, from your uh, from your insurance companies at a certain moment. There, there are real reasons for this level of privacy, and I think to contest it uh, is crazy. Um, the second thing I would just say, though, is this, this meme that's come out on this panel around the idea that privacy is only about shame, I think, is a very narrow definition of the benefits and values of privacy. And that I may look at my husband in a private way, I may have shared stories with my best friends that are private, that are nothing about shame at all, but that are about a level of intimacy that I am granting to them. And the idea that somehow all of this is fair game in the future seems crazy to me. So a positive idea behind it, not just shame. Just for clarity, do we think we s anybody said that, that the privacy is only a matter of shame? I heard that, I heard that a couple times. I quoted Jonathan Franzen, who wrote But Franzen, yeah, but I don't, I don't, I don't yeah, think we necessarily. Yeah, it wasn't necessarily expressing this my own view. Yeah, yeah, just, just for clarity, I don't think that, the, 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 relax, the meme is not taken off as badly as you think. That's all I'm trying to suggest. Hi, Jackie Kerr. Um, 
I wanted to add to that actually on um, shame. Uh, my immediate reaction to that quote was I, I thought it was a great quote, but I also th thought of, I, I've studied Soviet history, and I thought of Joseph Brodsky's essays about the um, need to hide in private kitchen settings to have real conversation during the late Soviet period. And I think that privacy can be constructed as being only about shame in a perfectly democratic society, perhaps, but certainly not in any society in which um, the public norms are not viewed as legitimate by all in that society. And in any non-democratic society, you really run into those issues. And I just thought that was a point worth throwing out there for the discussion. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, we know historically as a matter of mission creep, if, if information can be collected and used against you, then ultimately it will be used against you. We, we know that historically, like uh, across the board. And that's what, you know, we live in a democratic society at the moment. I'm grateful for that. But uh, I think to assume that this society will always be democratic and that information will always have the protections it has now is fatuous, I, you know, in my personal opinion. So I, I completely agree with you. Dystopian and utopian are, 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 are no, it's, Jeff, it's not a dystopia. It's I think that's it's dystopian. Just, yeah, it's it historical. Well, uh, okay. Let me, let me, let me, I'm not going to speak myself. We have two. Hi, uh, Shreya Murthy, a Berkman intern. Um, I'm actually uh, writing a paper right now, um, reviewing uh, the work of Daniel Solov. Who, if any of you guys are interested in a sort of like the legal and philosophical basis of the way we think about privacy, specifically in the courts. Um, it's an excellent read. He's got a paper called The Taxonomy of Privacy. And one thing that I think is really relevant to, you know, the idea of like shame as being, um, you know, the main justification for a right to privacy. Um, the courts have actually recognized that there is such a thing as dignitary harm, which occurs when privacy is breached, that there are, there's a certain sense of your person and your personal effects that is harmed when there is a breach of privacy. And um, I just think that that's something that, you know, we should recognize. This is an understood concept that there is something specifically wrong with putting a person in a position where they don't feel comfortable acting freely or thinking freely or doing anything um, that they, in a society that recognizes free speech as such an important value should be able to do. Yeah, that's right. And, and it's not just about the transition to totalitarianism, it's about the transition out of totalitarianism as well. I mean, one of the, my, the, my favorite historical examples is all the information that was collected by the East German security state wound up in the Stasi archives. When that regime fell, that information became freely accessible all of a sudden, and people's life chances were harmed by it. And only in retrospect did you know, people judge them on the basis of the actions that were taken 20 or 30 years ago without having any understanding about the things Stipulate, that- Stipulate, Your Honor, bad things can happen, but if all, all I'm trying to say is if all we do is manage every choice we have and we don't join in with our fellow human beings enough because of these, these fears, 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 I think we're gonna lose the benefit and the power of this tool of publicness that we now, thank you, internet folks, have. I think the fear is is, uh, is really relevant. I mean, that you keep bringing this this uh, this concept. I think is very important because it seems to me that we are still in the paradigm of the Benham paradigm. We are being watched. We don't know when, by who, who is collecting our data. So we are all in prison, in a way, a society in this uh, in this in this condition. If we follow what Adam is saying, for example, right? But there are other aspects of it. I mean, our notions of privacy keep changing. Have, so it's not or not enough privacy is not the same that it was in the Victorian age or that it was even before. Uh, this morning somebody said that privacy uh, basically started in the Victorian age. So you said something about quoting someone about shame, but shame is also you know, defined culturally. Uh, Robin Evans wrote a very beautiful article uh, called uh, Figures, Doors, and Passages, where analyzing architectural space, he talked about how in the space of the Renaissance there are these palaces that lead from one room to another, and, and people will be passing by, and people will be making love, or defecating, or everything, and everybody had a sense of privacy, despite the fact that they are being exposed, right? So the introduction of the wall in architecture to separate what is private and public is historical, too, as it is uh, the, the construction of that wall with the open plan of the Corbusier, etc. So we are in a new paradigm where definitions of what is private and public are changing, 
And, and you know, for example, uh, a, few, a couple of years ago there was, or a few years ago there was an article in the New York Times, maybe it's now 10 years ago, uh, the uh, manufacturers of cordons and says were all going out of business because people didn't think anymore that they have to have them, right? So in an age in which we are all so much more exposed through uh, new media, people didn't feel, I mean, that the court and in your world was such a kind of uh, point thing to have, right? So we are more able, and then our concerns with privacy have changed too. As it has been repeatedly said, it has more to do with our medical histories uh, than with other uh, aspects that may have preoccupied uh, the Victorian age, right? So what is in interesting, I think, about this conversation is that it expresses the fears of us as a society in multiple uh, ways, and that's what we should be paying attention to. I I what is our... Uh yeah, I think we'll agree at the end of it, is that one is making a bet on the future. So when a gay or lesbian person comes out and uses the power of that publicness to fight down the bigots and gets married in public and is registered, they're making a bet that they're not going to find a backlash and turn around that gays will again be shoved back in the closet, whether it's totalitarian governments or anything. And that's a bet that one chooses to make on optimism. And that's the kind of negotiation we're going through right now. I think we've run out of time entirely. Anybody want to respond to that? Or? Okay, I want to thank the panel very much for a discussion that went in surprising ways. Thank you.